All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. If you have questions from yesterday or over any of the old material or anything, please let me know. We have two planned video modules left to go over, and then after that, I will go over kind of ad hoc over some of the stuff I've been developing to add on to this course, but it'll be in a less formal setting. Okay, so um, let me know if you have any questions, and we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, this is Professor Nathan Wheezy of Marquette University. This section we're going to talk about the three-phase PLL part two and what we're going to do here is talk about implementing this in the digital fashion now using a floating point variant and we're going to use the backwards Euler approximation. Okay, so let's just quickly recall. We have a controller, this is what we're trying to design. What we did in the previous uh, section was a continuous time one, and it was a PI controller. We're going to do a PI controller again here, but we're just going to convert it to the Z domain. This is our ABC to DQ transform, and just recall that really this is our this is the thing that generates the error because we want to drive Q to zero. So think of that as almost our our detector, if you will. This is the center frequency. That's essentially what we want to lock around. This is our integrator, our 1 over s in the real time, which we've approximated here. And of course, this is our mod. This is just doing the phase wrapping. So this has no gain to it in terms of phase because all it's doing is wrapping. And this is just so we don't have overflow in the number system. <laughs> that we represented in, in for example um, if we use floating point here this could grow so large that it would roll over or overflow or underflow or anything like that okay so let's talk about the design um, design is going to be very same very similar except for we're going to transform this into the z domain let's go ahead and do that first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show some MATLAB script code that I've done to design this controller. So we set VG to 170. Again, this is the gain of the of the, um, of the grid voltage. Zeta, that's our damping ratio. And again, we can pick a different one. That's why it's nice to have it scriptable. And this is a natural frequency. We can pick different values here. Whatever we'd like. And equa equation six and seven, this is the gains for the controller, Ki and Kp. All right, so once we have those calculated, essentially the controller is, is um, designed, but now we want to go ahead and convert this controller over to the Z domain. So first things first, um, we create a transfer function of S, so S is now an, a transfer function object within the MATLAB's um, workspace, and we can use that to instantly draw equations for transfer functions. Um, an interesting thing here is we're going to use this option structure, which you can use for passing to Bode function, and we're all we're going to do is the default is in radians, and I generally like to look at it in hertz, so we're just going to set hertz in terms of the Bode plot stuff. Line 12, that this is our controller. So we're just defining our controller as a function of our gains, Ki and Kp. Um, 13, that's the gain of the, the rest of the gain of the stage. Vg is the constant gain of the, the detector, and 1 over s is the integrator gain. And that's all we have. And then essentially this is our open loop gain. So we multiply those two together. And then we calculate closed loop response. And this min real, let's talk about this quick. This is a nice um, function. If you have a pull and a zero MATLAB and they're, they're the same, like you have S over one plus S over one, MATLAB will not automatically pull cancel. And if you call min real on a transfer function that's got a matching zero and pull, it'll then give you basically the minimum realization of the transfer function. So sometimes you have to do that because you have some pulls and zeros that don't cancel and you'd like to get rid of them. Okay, cool. So um, 17 here, this 17, 18, and 19 will give us a body plot.
essentially we can look at the gain and phase of our controller um, of our open loop response and closed loop response to make sure that we met our bandwidth bandwidth spec and our damping ratio spec etc all right so how do we convert this to an actual controller in the digital domain that's not too hard first um, this line here is the sampling time so right here I have it set for 10 kilohertz and that's going to be plenty enough plenty enough for this application especially when you're trying to lock to like 60 Hertz I mean an order of magnitude is 600 Hertz another order is 6 kilohertz or at least two orders of magnitude higher than what we're trying to lock to which is, is in general pretty good um, this is our Z transform so we create a transfer function object in the Z domain, capital Z, with a sampling time of 10 microseconds. And then we can write 25, which is essentially um, the backwards Euler approximation for S. S approx, right? And then what we do is we go ahead and feed that into 26. So this will be our digital controller using the backwards approximation. And of course, I went ahead and in line 27 and 28 calculated them using different approximations like zero order hold and Tustin using MATLAB's predefined function C, C2D, you, um, which will convert a continuous time system to discrete using different approximations. The only downside is they don't have one for backwards Euler, so I just made it up by myself there. Okay, cool. So what will happen now is we'll actually have the transfer functions for those in the Z domain, but what I'd like to really get is the coefficients of the filter so that I can put them directly into my C code on my microcontroller. So this, these nice little lines of code here, 31 through 36, what, what's going on here is first we're grabbing the numerator coefficients of the digital controller, and they're actually in a cell. That's why this curly brace one. And in this cell is a vector of the coefficients. So this will be a vector of coefficients, and the last thing I'm doing is calling single around it, and what that is doing is converting those from double floating point, because that's the default number system in, in MATLAB, to a single precision floating point, which is probably in general what you will have if you have a floating point unit that's the type you generally have on uh, low cost microcontrollers is a 30 is a single precision floating point so this b coefficient and a coefficient line 31 and 32 will be vectors of single precision floating point numbers okay and then what we'll do is just print them out in a nice easy fashion in the prompt that's line 33 through 36 defined in c code so i just wrote float a1 equals percent f or percent f is the first um, element in a coefficient vector which is a single precision floating point number okay so what actually comes out of this this is split across two pages I apologize but like for instance float a1 is just one float a0 is minus one okay <clears throat> that's not too bad float b1 is 5.406614 and float b0 is minus 5.174388 and again, these are in single precision. And literally what I do is I can just take this code that spits out from MATLAB, this stuff right here, and literally paste it into my um, controller code and compile it for my microcontroller and I'm off. I have my controller designed. Okay, so this was a continuous time controller that we designed in the previous uh, section we talked about. This is the um, controller in the, in the Z domain now, our digital controller. And you can see the coefficients match up with the floats up here. So we have good matching agreement. So you can see one thing here is just the way I wrote the code here. It's not displaying all the digits out, but this is the more accurate representation in single precision floating point. And this is also the more accurate um, representation in single, single precision floating point. So let me go ahead and just point to where these all go. So that one's here, that one of course is here, and then of course you see the one minus one which is down here. Okay, so you can see those are the gains of our controller. So there's a pull at one and a zero at 0.957, so we're, we're stable when we look at the controller in terms of internal mode stability. 
Let's go ahead and look at the output of our controllers to a couple of different transients that you may see on the line. This is similar to what we did in continuous time, but now we actually have a backward Zeller discrete digital controller. So what happens here is we're going to have a voltage step of 17 volts at 0 0.011 in time. So what happens here is if you look at the voltage, you see this step right here of about 17 volts in red. And it actually happens in yellow and blue. Pretty hard to see, but it is indeed there. Okay, so what's the effect? From the digital sense, our D-axis looks exactly the same, except for at this time, we jump about 17 volts on the D-axis. Q doesn't change, we remain locked, which is really nice. We just had a magnitude change. We didn't have a phase or a frequency, so that's good. We remain locked here. Control output looks the same, and if you look at our phase, you can see it's digitized here, which is great. This is what you would, would expect to see in a digital controller. Okay, so the response here is any, isn't any different than what we saw in, in the uh, continuous time variant, except for our values are now digital. They're discrete time steps. You have some precision, finite precision. Let's look now what happens when we have a step in line voltages, sorry, excuse me, a phase step of 0 0.62 radians. This is a pretty extreme case, but let's just go ahead and uh, illustrate what happens here. So we're gonna have this happen at about 0.21 in time. So I'm just draw this line straight down. You can see, you can see, actually let me do this a different way. Um, you can see that we have something interesting here. We have a step in phase, so if you look at the voltages, you can see how we have this discrete step. It happens instantaneously. This one steps here, this one steps there, and blue steps like that. This is a pretty drastic case for voltages, but that's the transient. And what happens is, because we lose our Q-axis alignment right away, immediately Q jumps up like this. It's saying, oh, we are not aligned. And so what happens is that this, essentially Q is our error. So if this is non-zero, you're gonna get something out of your controller. So the controller actuator output go, jumps from zero up to like 600, like, hey, we're, we're misaligned. Let's push the system towards alignment here. And you can see as we push harder and harder and time goes on here, you can see even in the phase response, we're like, oh, we need to speed up because there's a jump. You see this kind of curvature. And then you can see about here we're locked in again. So somewhere about, oh, let's call it five milliseconds later, about here is where we're locked in. And we can tell because Q is driven back to essentially zero again. And we have no error in that, after that phase jump. So you can see this control is working nice. Um, just like the continuous time variant, even in the digital domain here, you can see we uh, our phase is digitized. Of course, it's a, a digital controller. Our, our voltages that come into our controller are digitized because we're sampling at a fixed frequency. Even, even our um, control actuation is digitized. Everything is digitized, and it's all digitized at 10 kilohertz here. All right, let's look at another transient here. We have a transient at 0.31 seconds, and this is a pretty drastic one. We're gonna have a frequency step. Now this one's, this is another very challenging um, um, transient that you wouldn't normally see a, this drastic of a, of a step in hertz discreetly like this. But what's happening is we go from 60 hertz instantaneously to 61 hertz. It's hard to see when you look at these voltages. Are they 60 or 61? But we jump right at 0.31. And you can see that's happening because if you look at the Q axis, the Q axis detects it right away. It comes up and then it comes down and settles. Okay? And what happens now, because of the, the actuation, we have to actuate in a positive fashion in order to speed the system up and to catch up to 61 hertz. And the other thing that I'll say here is this does not, the control output does not settle to zero again because it's going to settle to whatever the control output is plus the center frequency. Well, we're at 61 hertz and the center is 60, so the control at output is going to settle at about one hertz in order for us to lock on to 61 hertz, which is what it's doing here. But this is in radians, okay? So it's not in hertz. That's why it's not one. Okay. <clears throat> 
let's see, that would be about 6.28 radians, which, it, you know, this axis is 10, so that's looking about right. All right, let's move on to another transient we have here. This will be our last transient. This is a, a very challenging one. Um, essentially, we're going to have an unbalance of phase voltages at 0.35 in time. Now, this could definitely happen. This is a real-world type scenario, especially if you're dealing with three phase. And you can, let's zoom in here quick. You can see I'm only doing it to the red phase. It's a 10% unbalance. And it's a, it's a big jump. And what happens when you have an unbalance now is that you have um, positive, negative, and uh, zero sequence voltages. All right? And so what that really translates to is you're going to have a harmonic, second harmonic, which you can see in Q, and you can also see in D. So the interesting thing here is that you're not going to be able to drive Q to zero here because your voltages are unbalanced. Okay, so what you're going to want to do is drive the average of Q, the average over that harmonic to zero. And if you do that, then again you can be locked here. So the average right down the middle. If you can drive that to zero, then you can remain locked, even though you have this oscillation. Now you can see that because Q is oscillating, the controller is just oscillating back and forth in terms of actuation output, in terms of in trying to track this. The good thing though is that we remain locked in this case even though we have this harmonic, but you can see, you can see this visually. So at zero phase we're at the peak of phase A which is essentially we're assigned, we're locked to cosine. So assume cosine um, of the blue waveform was zero. So cosine of zero would be the max amplitude. So you can see visually here, we are indeed locked to this, even in the presence of this harmonic component or unbalance. There really wasn't much of a transient to the system. Now, what you could do in a more advanced case for this PLL is to break your th three phase voltages up into positive sequence, negative sequence, and um, um, zero sequence. And then essentially what you want to do is, is lock to the positive sequence voltages. And that way it will remove all issues related to unbalance. You won't even see this oscillation in the unbalance because your positive swing kids will always be balanced when you break it up into positive, negative, and zero. And what will happen is when you have an unbalance on the voltages, it will show up in like your zero sequence components. Okay, cool. This concludes the discussion on the three-phase PLL using floating point numbers and using the backwards Euler approximation. Okay, awesome. Um, we just completed this video. So um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and send them. I'll wait about five minutes before I start moving on to the next one. Thank you.
Yes, Eric. Um, great question. I believe we we definitely did. Let me go back and I'll just quick check which one exactly it is. You can go reference it. It's probably in the third one. Yeah, it would be in the third one for sure. Let's see here. Yep, and there's a good discussion about backwards dealer and all that good stuff in there. So check the third one, um, the PDF and the video. So there's a question about the M files. I'm assuming you're talking about the PLL. Uh, I believe the way I wrote, I certainly can provide them. I, um, what I'm thinking is the way I wrote them, I tried to include the code into the PDF so that you could just do a copy paste. So um, at least that's the way I did it. Then you don't have to track all these different files. So yeah, I believe I even have the highlighting set up so you don't copy like the numbers. So it should, you should be able to just copy the, the M file directly from the PDF. And that's kind of why I set it up that way. Okay, it looks like we don't have any further questions, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on 
our last planned video module here. Welcome, this is Nathan Wheezy from Marquette University. This section we're going to talk about the three-phase PLL. We're going to talk about it converting to floating point controller and we're also going to use the Tustin approximation. Okay, so let's recall the major components. This really here is our detector or our ABC to DQ transformation. Now the great thing about using this is it detects when we're in phase or out, out of phase by detecting Q if Q is zero. Well, great. We are locked, if it's not, we're unlocked. The great thing is you're gonna need this anyways, generally when you're in a three phase application because not only do you need it for the PLL, but you're gonna need it to convert, for instance, the voltages so you know what the magnitudes are. If you're doing power control, you need the voltage and the current and then you can control power, et cetera. So it kind of serves dual purpose here. Anyways, so that's our detector. We're going to have our controller. This will be using uh, a PI and we'll be doing the Tustin approximation. Recall this is our center frequency. This is the frequency we're trying to lock onto. Now we can lock onto that plus or minus some percentage. This is our actuation signal coming out of the controller. And essentially what this will be is how far off are we from the center frequency. Okay. <clears throat> So this will be omega going into the integrator, it'll spit out theta, and this mod block is just the wrapper so that we don't overflow on theta, okay? So it really has no gain, it just makes sure we wrap it properly. And then this is fed back all the way to our DQ because our DQ is based on what we think the angle of the voltages are right now. Okay, so that was a quick review of the control structure here. Now we're going to have some of the similar code we had in the previous section but we're going to convert this to Tustin and you look at that controller. So um, we go ahead and clear everything out. We set our voltage, our damping ratio, our natural frequency, and then we calculate the KI and KP gains based upon that. So you could change these, it's scriptable if you want to do this, but um, these two guys here are our controller gains. So the controller at this, pro pro um, this point is already designed. Now we just got to convert it really. So in these steps here, we're going to create transfer function in MATLAB for the controller, the plants, the open loop, and the closed loop. And this is just for viewing purposes. So if you run this, it'll pop up some figures and you'll be able to view these different transfer functions. Down here, this block of code, we're going to convert to digital controllers. And I have three of them here just for reference, but the one we'll use is Tustin. So this is the Tustin line here. But I also have zero order hole and back order dealer. Now you can see what I'm doing here in these next few lines is that I am calling. I'm asking for the numerator and denominator coefficients of the digital version and the Tustin approximation, and then I'm calling single, which essentially creates a single uh, precision floating point number of those um, coefficients, which I can then port directly into C code. So this generates C code right here for us to copy and paste. These are the coefficients. So again, these generate the coefficients for it and print this out. Let's take a look and see what it prints out. Prints out these floating point numbers in text right on the screen. You can copy and paste this directly into your C controller code then um, when you're developing it. All right, so let's take a look and see how these match up. Of course, you can see A1 and A0 are one and negative one. You can see how those match. Directly in the denominator, we have one right here and minus one. Okay, that's awesome. 
and then we have our 5.29 and we also have our minus 5.58275 so you can see we're implementing a controller here we have a zero at 0.95 and a pull at one so we should be pretty we should have good internal stability now let's take a look and see what type of response we're going to have for various types of conditions using this Tustin approximation. Now these gains were a little bit different than the ones from the uh, backwards dealer. So we're going to have a voltage step at time 0 0.1. So you can see the voltage step on the d-axis shows up right here. You're also going to see it show up in the actual voltage down here in red and it is actually happening in blue and yellow but it's a little bit harder to see um, because of the digitization but it's a it's a pretty steep step and you can see here all it actually does it's a balanced change so all three voltages experience it so you don't see anything on Q it's just humming along working perfectly and of course since Q doesn't change either does the output we're locked on completely and of course the phase doesn't change because U is not changing so we're locked here and you can see of course our digitization here we're having good um, good signals for the phase and we are completely locked on and th this transient is pretty easy um, to do with this controller since it doesn't affect Q it's not going to affect U or anything so let's check a different transient here we have the line voltages here are going to experience a all three of them expose uh, a phase shift at 0 0.21 if we go ahead and zoom in and look you can see that the three voltages this is a pretty extreme case are jumping <coughs> ahead in phase so what you you see here is this is the d-axis this experiences a jump here but it actually settles down pretty quickly you can see that Q comes out of lock immediately which means the controller output immediately jumps up to try to correct it so this is the controller output and what it's trying to do is speed up essentially the VCL or the integrator so that we can speed up the phase and catch up with where we were at and you can actually see that right here you can see instead of the phase being nice and linear it has this little hump because the output of the controller is saying hey you need to speed up and catch up and of course as we get closer to the actual phase we kind of undershoot just a little bit and then we come back up and lock on so after about oh let's call it one millisecond right about here we're pretty much locked again so from here on over which is nice so big transient uh, we lock pretty well even in the face of a transient like that so now let's look at another one if our line voltages have a 1 hertz step at 0.31. So what's happening here is our voltages over here are at 60 hertz and then over here they're at a 61 hertz and it's a hard step. <laughs> and you can see what happens is you immediately notice it in Q. And since that is essentially our air that gets fit, fed into our controller and this is now going to make our controller actuate to catch up with it because it's now faster and there's going to be an offset so this should be about 6.28 radians because the output of U is radians and if you add that to 60 Hertz you're going to get 61 Hertz so 6.28 radians is about 1 Hertz and that'll stay at 1 Hertz now one thing I'll note here is you know there there's a certain range of frequencies you can lock but you know if you're at 59 to 61 most utilities have a way higher to, uh, tolerance on that so seeing something out this this high away from 60 is a pretty extreme case so you won't have to worry too much about the width of the capture um, frequency meaning do I have to be able to capture like 55 Hertz or lock on to 65 you're, you're not going to see that just because other things are going to collapse much bef way before you actually see a frequency like that all right lastly we're going to consider looking at line voltages in response to a 10 percent um, voltage imbalance and that happens at about 0.35 so over here we're balanced if you look at the three phase voltages and then over here we're unbalanced and it's pretty easy to see you can see it in the red waveform it's actually just red 
that becomes unbalanced by about 10%. It's 10% lower than the other two phase voltages. And what you see because of this unbalance now is that we have harmonics in both D and Q. And this is going to be present because we're oscillating. We're not, our, our vector that is um, in the, the uh, DQ axis actually has a little bit of an oscillation uh, in reference to 60 hertz. So that's why it shows up. And in fact, you can go back to the math and do the DQ transform and, and, sh and show that it shows up. Or prove it to yourself it shows up. So it's, <coughs> it's okay as long as you maintain the average of Q around zero. In other words, you drive the average of Q to zero, which is what's happening in this case. I mean, there's an oscillation on top of it, but it's centered around zero, which essentially means we are locked. Now, this isn't the most ideal case because if you zoom way in here, if you zoom way in, you might have just a little bit of phase um, bending going on, which means that instead of this being straight, it's very hard to see. You might get something like this. Now, it's really drastic here. It's hard to see again, but instead of this being straight, I'll try to make this a little bit more drastic. It's kind of like this, but it's very hard to see. It's very slight, very, very slight. Now, how do you alleviate something like that? Well, essentially what you got to do is first decompose your voltages into positive sequence, negative sequence, and zero sequence. So your ABCs would come in, and you would basically, through math, generate these three. And then what do you want to do? Well, you actually want to lock on to the positive sequence. So you're going to do basically an ABC to DQ here, and then you're going to get D and Q and what you want to do is use Q you want to lock on to this or in other words drive that to zero and if you do this this is again from power systems this stuff here let me point a positive negative and zero sequence is something you learn in power systems class if you do this then essentially your your DQ or your uh, three phase PLL will be invariant to um, on load on balances okay because the unbalances will only show up here in the zero sequence and the negative sequence and they won't show up in the positive sequence. In other words, the positive sequence will always be a set of three phase balance voltages, irregardless of the tr if the, the true ABC voltages on the grid are, are unbalanced, okay? And that, that's good because then in DC you can track um, your objective, you can lock onto a frequency even in the face of unbalance, which is great. Okay, thank you for this. Again, this is a conclusion to the three phase PLL using a digital controller with the Tustin approximation. Thank you. Okay, that goes, that is a wrap on the actual modules that are fully developed. I think there's about 30 of them. So please, uh, I'm gonna wait about five minutes here. Um, please send in your questions that you have on anything. It doesn't have to be just this module you watched. We'll go ahead and address those. And if everybody wants to stay, I can go over four modules that I'm developing and talk about a fifth that isn't started, but that I'm going to develop. So also feedback, I would really appreciate any feedback. You guys have had excellent questions, but there's so much that you could cover in this area. Let me know if there's something you'd like me to cover that I didn't or cover more in depth or hit on a certain point or anything. Um, I'm looking to improve these. You are actually the first time of my actual run through these after they've actually been developed. So nobody's actually gone through these and, and tried to consume them. So I really appreciate your feedback as a consumer. Let me know. Let me know what's helpful, what's not, what I can do better, et cetera. So thank you. Um, I'll wait now for about five minutes for questions. If not, I'll, I'm going to kind of go into a very, uh, uh, crude run through some of the ones that are not fully developed, but we'll talk about them and uh, and uh, field any questions regarding them.
Uh, Richard, good point. Um, this is an awesome point. Actually, this is one of those modules I'm gonna that's in development that I'm gonna show you actually has a notch filter. It's actually got, it's two notch filters. But um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. So whenever you have an imbalance and you're going from ABC to quadrature DQ, um, any harmonic that shows up, um, sorry, any imbalance shows up as like the second harmonic. So yeah, you can go ahead and put a notch filter, the second harmonic, and that will mitigate that. Absolutely. So you'd want to put that in your Q axis and you want to put it after, right after your ABC to DQ transform. So you can definitely do that. And it's a really good point. And maybe that's a, um, a, uh, additional thing that I could add to this, um, three phase one. So thanks for pointing that out. That's a very good point. Um, it'd be important to also elaborate on what harmonics show up in the Q axis due to what inputs. So an imbalance of course produces a 120 Hertz, you know, what else would happen? Like what, what happens when you have a third harmonic on the, um, three phase voltages? Usually I believe it shows up as the fifth or seventh. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think the fifth. So what do you do there? Do you filter, do you put notch filters at all the harmonics or what do you do? So very interesting question and, and great point. Thank you for sharing. And uh, Richard, just out of curiosity, uh, you're not on the registration list. So if you don't mind uh, either publicly or privately, if you could share your affiliation and your role at your affiliation. Thank you. Hey, Richard, thank you for sharing. Are you up in Menominee Falls or elsewhere? I know there's there's eaten all over the world. So uh, where, where are you located?
Ah, congrats, MU grad. Small world. Uh, I was just up there for a meeting uh, with Antonio and uh, Stephen Schmaltz and Andrew Rockhill. So uh, you have a beautiful place up there in uh, Menominee Falls. Okay, looks like we don't have any further questions. Um, what I'm going to attempt to do here is go through some stuff that I'm currently in development. Not fully complete, actually, nor near complete. So there's probably going to be mistakes, and this is definitely going to be a trial by fire and won't be as smooth as the videos. But that's okay. Um, we're here to learn. Please ask any questions during. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care if you ask questions during or after, whatever. Um, and uh, we'll go through these. Um, they're gonna be quite short because again, they're not fully developed, but um, yeah. Let's, let's, let me share the screen here and uh, we'll start with this. So one of these I have is um, talking about number systems. And so I think this is really important, even if you're a power electronic engineer to understand and you're doing the controls to understand some of the number systems because you're gonna put the controllers into this A number system and it's important to understand kind of the, how the math works there. So let me get this screen shared here. Okay, I think everybody can see this. So this is gonna, I kind of have three modules I'm developing on um, number systems and they're focusing on fixed point and floating point. And so this one here is fixed point and um, what we're gonna focus on here is just um, introducing kind of fixed point, how, how to think about it. Um, and I'm going to do this example from the standpoint of using 32 bits. You certainly could translate this to 16 bits and, and maybe I'll add another module that's just like this, but just focusing on 16 bit. 16 bit is just uh, usually when you're in a more cost constrained application. I mean, you have a, a cheaper processor and with a cheaper processor, you may only have a 16 bit, bit processor. And that doesn't mean you can't do 32 bit math, it just means that if you have a 16-bit processor, your math on the processor is done at 16-bit. In order to do 32-bit, you're doing multiple ins instructions. So if like you wanted to add 30, two 32-bit numbers, you got to add two 16-bit um, lower end numbers, do the carryover and add that to two 16-bit numbers on the high end and then kind of merge that all together and store the memory properly. So. Um, in the end, what it means is when you're doing 32-bit math on a 16-bit processor, you're doing multiple CPU instructions and cycles to complete an instruction usually that would complete in one cycle if it were on an actual 32-bit processor. So 
It happens a lot when you have uh, cost constrained applications and you want to, you're just you're using a 16 bit processor and you can get stuff done with 16 bits. Definitely. There's, there's no problem there, but the lower amount of bits are the more susceptible in general. It's a very general statement, but uh, more susceptible you are to having unstable control loops because you don't have as much precision available to you. All right, so this one's gonna focus on um, 32 bits, okay? And so we're gonna kind of just introduce the Q format, okay? So 32 bits literally means we have 32 bits that are either zero or one, right? And they, you go, you have the 31st bit all the way down to what we'll call the zero bit. Okay, so they're just a string of numbers and of, of ones and zeros. And it kind of looks like this. So you have the zeroth position all the way up to the 31st. Now, generally you would like to have bipolar numbers. They just mean they swing positive and negative. So actually with a 32 bit number, you only have 31 bits of precision because the highest bit, the most significant is actually tracking the sign. So a one here in this bit position would mean a negative number and a zero would mean a positive number. So you actually only have 31 bits of precision to represent your number. Okay, so how do we do this? Okay, so this equation one is actually a really great equation for any arbitrary representation of numbers in the Q format. What is Q format? Q format, uh, whoops, I'll explain like this. So generally it's written with let's say X, Q, Y for lack of a better notation where X is some number and so is Y. And what happens here is these two should sum up to one bit less than how many bits you have for your number. So like um, you could have, for instance, zero Q 31. And what does this mean? It means you have zero integer bits and 31 fractional bits. And what generally the notation is you kind of just drop the integer. I mean, I see this all the time. So instead of writing zero Q 31, people just write Q 31. It's assumed that the, the, the extra bit is the sign bit. But what about one Q 30? A lot of times people just write this Q 30 shorthand. It just means you have 30 fractional, one bit for sign, and you have one left over. That's your integer bit. So you can see you have lots of choice here. All this is really saying is where is the decimal point? Okay. And so, so like if you had a Q31, zero, we'll call it zero Q31, you can't represent one or negative one. You can almost get up to one and can almost get to negative one, but you can't get one or negative one because you don't have any integer bits. So you have two to the minus 31 fractional bits here, but you won't be able to get that. So just very roughly, this would cover a number between negative 0.999 and 0.9999. Okay, so what happens here in equation one is this covers for, this covers any arbitrary Q format that you select here. So you could figure out what n the number represents by using this equation for any Q format you are in. All right, and so you can see that this first part of this always is the, the 31st bit is always multiplied by minus one. So if it's zero, well, then you have a zero number, et cetera. All right, so that equation covers us for all our different Q formats. Um, if we are in Q0, okay, what is Q0? Q0 is actually means you have no integer bits. That means you have 31, Sorry, I said that wrong. Q0 means you have zero fractional and 31 integer. So that means you would just have fractional bits. Or just Sorry, you'd only have integer numbers. You couldn't represent any um, non-integer number. And you could represent a number up to 2 to 32 minus 1. Um, that would be the highest number that you could represent. Okay, so when you're in Q0 like this, this is what your bits would represent. You can see these are all integer and you have your sign bit. 
And to do the equation here, to represent your number, you would have equation two. All right, I do actually, I think I notice, I actually already have a problem in this equation I'll have to fix. But I believe what's happening here is this needs to be multiplied, not added. So this right here is already a mistake. This controls the sign, but you don't add or subtract negative one. You need to multiply um, by it. So I have to figure out this equation right here for the sign is not correct. So I have to fix that in the notes up. Okay, so you can already see I got some issues in developing this. So I'm not I'm not done. That's okay. All right. So how would we represent the number one in Q zero? And the solution to that is right here. Okay, and how would this look? Well, your your bit in the zeroth position is right here, and it's a one, and you're multiplying that by two to the zero. And of course, two to the zero is one, so you get one. The rest of these in this sum are all zeros because all your other bits are zero. And so that's how you'd represent one in Q zero. But why don't we just take this a step further? I don't have it here in the notes, but why don't we add, why don't we figure out how to represent one in Q1? So Q1 would be one fractional bit, um, 30 integer bits and one sign bit. So if we were to represent it in Q1, this would actually be your fractional, your lone fractional bit. This is where the decimal point would be. And here's your first integer bit. And so this would then be a one and this would be a zero. And you could see that this would represent one in Q1. If you wanted to do like a half, let's say we wanted one half in Q1. So Q1, let's do one half. You would have a one here, a zero here. And why is it a one? Because this one would be one times two to the negative one. And the rest of these would be zero. And that would be your one half. So you can see this point, can, you can place it wherever you want. But once you place it, it's fixed. That's what we mean by fixed point. All right, so fixed uh, point format for Q31. So going, going completely the other way, that means we have zero Q31. We have no integer bits all fractional and one sign bit that would be right here so we have the sign right here and this is all fractional if we wanted to know what this number um, represented we would have this equation right here equation three all right and again this this part right here is wrong but i'll fix that in a subsequent note set the rest of this is is okay um, so anyways these would all be fractional bits and so the, the biggest number that you could represent would be 0.9999 something. In fact, if you wanted to write explicitly what the number was in, um, in MATLAB, you'd have to write 2 to 31 minus 1 and then shift this to the right um, 30 times. If you don't want to shift to the right, that's okay. We can also multiply this by two to the minus 30. This will give you the number. So it's 0.999 something, something, something. And I can switch to MATLAB later and show you what this is, but it's really close to one, but it's not exactly one. All right, so what's the smallest number you can represent? The smallest number would be whatever happens when you have just a one in this bit position. Okay, so in fact, what would that be? That would be, one times two to the minus 31. Okay, sorry, I had a question here. Let's see, I'll probably messed something up. <laughs> Is the range of Q31 correct? Shouldn't the negative and positive maximums be equal? Okay, so I, where, where do I have that? That's right. Yeah, this has to do with two's complement. I think I have this right, but I'll check it in MATLAB in one sec. I'm almost to the end of this note set because I'm not complete, but I will check for you, Eric, um, if I had this range right. We'll do it as a, an, an exercise in MATLAB and follow along. I think it's right, but I think it has to do with two's complement, but we'll double check. Okay, uh, let's see. So the smallest number you could represent is if you just had a one here and all zeros the rest of the way, this will give you two, one times two to the minus 31. This is the smallest number you could represent. And I think I have that hashed out. 
that is this number right here. So that number, very long, I know, but it's one times two to the minus 31. And so this is pretty important because you wanna make sure any math that you do in terms of addition, multiplication, and adding, dividing, et cetera, is always greater than this, so you don't lose precision at least. Um, I find this happens a lot of times if you have an integrator. Um, it, it's possible, not likely, but possible that um, you could be integrating and the number you add each delta step could be less than this, which essentially means you're not incrementing or integrating at all. So you always wanna check kind of your smallest number, your highest number, and make sure that you keep all your math within that range. Okay, so I think for this note set, yeah, this is the end of this. And again, this is just kind of trial by fire here. It's not completely, um, it's not completely complete here. What I am going to add in the future is some just showing basic math, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and just to show what to check for in overflow, underflow, um, and uh, loss of precision, et cetera. So now that that's there, let me go ahead and switch over to MATLAB and see if I can answer Eric's question properly without messing it up. <laughs> It'll be a challenge myself. Let's see if I can do it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share this screen here. We'll switch over to MATLAB. And I think everybody ought to be able to see this. So let's just clear everything out and see if I can't mess this up. All right, so we're in Q31. So let's just write this for my own information. We're in Q31 and so the largest number that we could represent uh, would be two to the 32 minus one in an integer format. This is just if you were in actually um, 31 Q zero. So this would be the integer format. So if I took this and downshifted it and represented the largest number I can in um, uh, Q31, Let's see what we get. So you have to multiply this by two to the minus 31. No, oh, I didn't, I definitely screwed that up. Let me just double check. Let's see, oh yeah, 31. I only have 31 bits, so that's my fault. It should be like this. Yeah, okay, great. So this right here is the largest positive number that you can um, represent in Q31. Okay, this is if, you had a zero for your sign bit and followed by 31 bits of one. This would be the largest number. And essentially, if you look at this, yeah, it's basically one. It's not exactly one, but it's basically one. Okay, so let's check the other end of things. Um, let's see. The other end of things would be if you had, let me switch back to the screen for a second and kind of hash this out in my brain. I think I got this right, but I wanna make sure. So we're back over to the screen for a second. So I believe, let me check the two's complement. This is gonna be two's complement. So you'd have, a, you'd have a one here in the sign bit and your largest number I think would be if you have, is it all zeros? So if you took the ones complement of this, you'd have zero and one, 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 and then you would add one that would give you this number, yeah. All zeros here, and this would be the sign bit. Yeah, actually you do get negative one if I'm correct. So I, I'm sorry, I'm doing this for a four bit number. So it, it's a little bit cryptic. Let me just explain this quick. So let's say we only had a four bit number. I think it's easier. I don't want to write 32 bits. Uh, so this is a four bit number. Here's my sign and then you have three bits to represent a number. And let's just call this Q3. So if we were in zero Q3, it means we have three fractional. These are all fractionals, the decimal points here and we have a sign. So this number looks kind of weird, but you have a one here, which means it's negative and three zeros. So in order to understand um, what this number represents in a negative fashion, you have to do two's complement, which I don't have um, anywhere in the notes, but I can add 
So how do you get the number it represents? Well, you invert everything. So you get a zero, one, one, so this is invert, and you add one. So if, if I just left this here, this is like um, one half plus one fourth plus one eighth, but I add one here. So what do you get? You actually get, not sorry, you don't, yeah, you do add one, so you get this, one, zero, 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 so you add one. This is two's complement. And so this actually does represent negative one. And so your, your whole range is negative one to this point nine, nine, whatever. So hopefully I explained that properly. You could do this with 32 but bits, do the math, but I think it's just a little bit easier to show you with four bits instead of 32. Um, Eric, did that uh, answer your question? Hopefully it did. Yes. Yeah, so yes, um, the fractional part is into you do two's complement for negative numbers. So when the sign bit is one, and the reason you do that is for rollover. So like if um, oh how to explain this? If you rolled, if you overflowed, you would you would overflow back to the the smallest largest negative number, if you will. So. Um, let's see if you had, yeah, let's, let's say you had, um, you're in a four bit number again and you had zero, one, one, one like this. This is actually the largest positive number you could represent. And this just to be shorthand is one half plus one eight, one fourth plus one eight. Okay. This is the number it represents, but let's say you added to this one more bit. What do you get? Uh, so let's say you added this. Well, binary is pretty easy. You're going to get this. Okay, what does this actually represent? This represents negative one. So if you look at the number system, kind of like this, let's say this is zero, this is 0 0.11, and this is 1.000. What happens is once you, if you keep, let me use a different color here, when you keep adding, you're going this way on your number system. And once you hit this one, you overflow back to here and you keep going this way. Yes, yep, that, that, is, that is absolutely correct. So if we use two's complement, we don't have to change the actual hardware when we're doing addition. That is 100% correct. Yeah, that's another, I think you put it better than I did. I, I was tr essentially trying to get to that, but yeah. I like how you put it. So we don't have to change any physical hardware. Addition is addition, subtraction is subtraction, multiplication is multiplication. That is correct. Yeah, okay, good point. So let's see, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Yep, and that's a great point. So I'm going to make a note to self here. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think you're a hundred percent correct on that. Um, it definitely works for positive, but for negative, I'm definitely going to have to think about that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Again, yeah, you can tell trial by fire, not, not completely ready for prime time yet, but thank you, yes. Um, uh, I'm gonna wait, uh, I don't know, give it two or three more minutes for questions on this, and then I got two more of these that are partially developed we can go through, and then I have a, another PLL that's developed in MATLAB, no PDF notes set, but I'll go over it in MATLAB. So I'll give you two or three more minutes, ask questions, and then uh, we'll move on.
All right, yeah, good question, Mortez. Uh, like, yeah, so when we're in Q1, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's go down to this quick. Um, so let's say we had 32 bits, so that'd be 30 Q1. Yes, you have sine, you have integer, integer frac, uh, decimal point and one fractional bit. And so this would be the zeroth, this would be the first, all the way up to 31st, 30th, and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, if you have a one here or a zero, it doesn't matter. This is the two to the negative one position. So that's the smallest number we can represent here, 0 0.5. We can't go below that. So that's 100% correct. So there's no other fractional number we can do integers and integers plus 0.5 in Q1. And so where you put the decimal point is ultimately up to you as a designer. But um, yeah, these are one of the choices you have to make once you start designing the control loop. But this is all about how do we represent the numbers and how do we interpret the numbers? But good question. Okay, so we got another question about minus five. So we want negative point. I'll show you how to go to, to kind of go back and forth between these. It's not hard, but I think the first time through it's a little bit confusing. So I'm going to lost my screen here. What's going on? Okay, give me one second. I'll answer your question here. Sorry, I got it. My pad is acting goofy here. All right, hopefully we can see this now. Okay, cool. So we want to do zero, minus 0 0.5. The way I would start is just start with 0 0.5 and then convert to negative. Okay, so if you wanted 0 0.5, uh, negative 0 0.5, start with 0.5. And if we're doing this in Q3, uh, sorry, you want this in Q1, and so we have 30. So our sign bit to start, just to start with a zero. Um, and then we have integer, integer, so on and so forth, integer bit, and then period is our fractional bit. And so this would be what it looked like for a positive number. In order to get the negative version of this, invert. and add one. So yeah, it looks like exactly what you gave me. So this would be invert, this would be add one. So yes, you're correct. All ones, Eric, would be negative 0.5. All right, I'm going to wait uh, one more minute and then uh, move on to the next one.
All right, cool. So I should have a second one. Let's see, is this the right? No, that's a duplicate. Where is it? Here we go. Okay, so this this is a really a follow on to just what we talked. So that was just to get you introduced to the Q format. And then this one is more of a, let's do some math with it with some Q formats that are generally used just in number systems that you would number spans or ranges that you would no normally use within parallel Okay, so it's going to be a little bit of the same here, but just doing a little bit more math with it to check. So we already know that this is wrong and this doesn't work for only for positive. So this is still going to be wrong. But anyways, looking at a Q30 number, so we have 30 fractional bits and one integer bit. Here's a one integer. And we have one sign bit here in blue and all the rest are in red. And so in this case, we can, the, the largest number we can represent is minus two. And the um, largest positive number is 1.999999999. And of course, if we want, and this doesn't look right. Well, let me check this. The finite precision of Q30 is this, but that looks wrong. So let's just check that actually. This is a good exercise. So let's check the precision of this. It's What I mean by precision is what is the smallest number um, that I can represent. So we're now in Q30. So we're now in Q30. So the smallest number would be as if we have a one um, in the zeroth bit position. So we're going to have to shift this to the right by 30 times. That's the same as multiplying by two to the minus 30. Yeah, so obviously my note set's wrong, but this is the number that we would get for the smallest number that we could represent in Q30. So essentially you have nine zeros and then we have a nine three one. I think what happened is when I did this, my MATLAB was rounding this off. So it does round off to that number I wrote in the net set, note set, but this is what it represents. Okay, so let me switch back here to my note set here. And yeah, so you can see how MATLAB rounded this to 0 0.00000001. 000 000 so anyways, we cross this out. That's the actual number and that's for Q30. Um, we can represent almost up to two and almost negative two. The number one is represented here. So as an example, if you wanted to know what one would look like in Q30, you essentially have a one in the only integer because this is multiplied by two to the zero, that position. So we're good to go there. Um, now, the other thing that I have not talked about is what happens on the actual processor. And that's what I kind of want to look at here. The actual number in the processor is going to be what I just boxed in here. This huge number that actually represents one. And so this is a little bit goofy. So it's like the processor is just going to do multiplication, addition, um, subtraction and division on integers. That's what the processor will do when you're in fixed point. And so when you're, when you represent the number, yeah, this is one, but this is the actual number on the processor. So, um, when you look at the memory location, that's the number that will actually be stored in that 32 bit location. And it's how you interpret the number where you get one out of there. You actually never have one stored there. It's this, so it's a little bit confusing, but there. Now, a, a format that I generally see a lot of on 32 bit fixed point is Q32. And I think it just lends itself, sorry, Q24, I said that wrong because it lends itself well to the numbers that you would need for applications. So a lot of times like this would be used for a controller, Q24 and fixed point. You can span negative 128 up to almost 128 or 127.999, et cetera. And you can figure out the precision of Q24 and let's just double check this while we're at it. Um, this again would be if we had a one in the lowest bit position 
And let's go back to MATLAB quick. And so how do we get this in this position? So we'd have a one, but it would be shifted to the right 24 times. And so it looks like I rounded this one as well. Yeah. So this actually represents 5.96 times 10 to the minus eight. So yeah, it's close enough to get the point on what it represents. But uh, let me switch this back over here. So that that's rounding it off again, but that's what it represents. It's a pretty small number. And so this is what it looks like when you have it in Q24 like this. You have one sign bit, you have seven integer looks like, and 24 fractionals. And so the number one representing Q24 format will be you have a one in the zeroth integer bit position. So this is times two. This is one times two to the zero here. And you have zero for the rest of fractional, zero for sine, and zero for the rest of the integer. And the actual number that's stored there, if you actually put this in the um, processor, is this number here. This is the actual integer. It's a 32-bit integer. That's this integer here. But it's how we interpret it. We're interpreting the decimal point in the 24th to 23rd position. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. It's, this is the actual number that's in memory, but it's how we represent it or how, what that integer actually represents. Okay, uh, let's see here. Again, this is going to be wrong. So we know this only works for positive. So something I got to fix it to do for me. Another number system I, or our Q format that I see a lot of is Q20. And this is a lot of times when you have voltages and currents and stuff. And so like easily a lot of the, the low voltage stuff I do, I'll see up to a thousand volts or 480 volts or something. And so Q20 is pretty good for representing numbers within that range because it'll get you to minus 2048 up to 2047.999, et cetera. And so um, the precision on this one, looks like I have another error here. This does not look right. So let's just calculate this quick and check it. And so we have one bit for in sign. We have, looks like 21, 11 bits for integer and 20 for fractional. So let's see what's the smallest number here. Yeah. So this is about 9.5367, et cetera, times 10 to the minus seventh. All right, let's go back to our, our video here. And so that's the smallest number you can represent. And again, this is the number one <laughs> represented in Q20. And it's also, again, a different integer. But that's just how we represent the number, okay? And so I don't have anything left in this. Um, what I'm going to do following up on this to develop more is do a bunch of different math operations and then do a simple, um, like, low-pass filter in Q20 or Q24 um, explaining how to actually write the code for the filter and how to get the outputs from it, et cetera. But again, this is short and this is the start of the development of this, but it's not done. So I'm going to pause here. Um, if you have questions, please let me know. I'll wait uh, three, four minutes. And if we don't have more questions, I'll go on to the, uh, the next one. Yes, okay, Richard, you have an awesome question. QMath. This is for TI. Um, this is a good point. So we can dive into this a little bit. This is something that I want to actually add to them. And that's why I'm talking about multiplication, addition, division, subtraction, etc. Um, 
<laughs> what do you do? How do you actually add these numbers, right, in fixed point? And so there's a nice little QMath library in TI, which will kind of handle all the difficulties for you. Let me show you, I'll, I'll kind of just hint on some of the difficulties and then explain what TI has done that makes it really easy on yourself. Okay, so let's get really basic here. Um, let's say we had a Q1 number and we're in 32 bits. So we have, sorry, this would be 30 Q1. Okay, all right, and let's do uh, a really basic, basic, basic number. Let's represent one and two, okay? So what does one look like? It's gonna be zero for the sign, a bunch of uh, zeros up until right before the decimal point. And so you'll have a one here and a zero here, right? So this is the 31st position, the 30th, all the way to the first and to the zeroth position. So this is what one would look like um, if you were representing in 30 Q1. Now let me do two and then we're gonna add them. Okay, so two would look like this, dot, 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 dot. We'd have a one, we'd have a zero, period, zero. Now this, this dot is false. This is just an integer, but I'm just putting it there so you know where it is. Okay, so everybody agrees this is what one looks like and what two looks like in um, fixed point when we're talking about a 30 Q1 number. Now let's go ahead and add them. Of course, we already know the result. That's great. We know it's three, right? So we're, what does it look like when we do the binary math? Well, we have a one here, so that stays here. This is one here and the rest are zeros. Okay, great. And so we agree that this right here is definitely three, right? So we have, this is one times two to the zero and this is one times two to the one and then you add them together. It's definitely three. So the result we got is right, both binary and adding the integer. This is how we do in the processor. We just add two integers. Um, and this is what we get for a result. Okay, this is all fine and dandy, great. Okay, now, what if we do something crazy like this? Let's do this, 30 Q1, and we're gonna have one again. So I'm just gonna copy this. And now let's add two to it again, but guess what? I'm gonna represent it in 31 Q0. Okay, that means there's no fractional bits. There's zero fractional bits. Okay, so duh, 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 duh. and we have two. So we're gonna have zero, one, zero. And there's no decimal point. Oh, actually it's over here. Okay, so I'm gonna point out a mistake here and then I'm gonna fix it and, and show you what QMath does and all that good stuff one of the many things it does. So if I had these two numbers in memory and I told them to add, please add them, what would they do? Well, this is what you would get. Okay. All right, in terms of integer, in terms of just a pure integer, this is the zero, sorry, this is the one, this is the two, this is the four. So it could be interpreted as a four if this were 31 Q zero. Or let's say the decimal point was here. It could be interpreted as a two in 30 Q one. Okay, so what happened? <laughs> this is obviously not one plus two. It, one plus two is not four and it's definitely not two. So what happened here? Well, if we just straight up add these two, you know, if we add these two and we tell the processor to do it, it did it. In fact, the result is this in binary. I agree, everybody should agree that the addition of these two in binary, we got the right result. The binary addition is not incorrect, but our result seems to be incorrect or the way we're interpreting or how we actually added it. All right, so that addition is right, but what happens is if you don't have this QMath library, this, you have to keep track of how you actually do additions. So you would never do a straight addition on the processor of a 30Q1 and a 31Q0. You have to do something. So what do you do? Well, you're gonna have to align them. So you could do it either way. And I, I forget, I think what, um, 
the QMath library will do is shift up to the most significant one, I believe. And so what that means is before it does this addition, it will take the 30Q1 representation of one and cast it to a 31Q0 number, okay? <laughs> and so what that means is it's actually going to go ahead and um, shift this 30Q1 number to the right one. And so one would then look like this, 00, zero, dot, 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 zero, zero, 001. So this is the 31Q0 representation of one, and then this would be 30 Q zero of two. And this of course is from earlier. I'm just copying this down. And then when we go ahead and add these binary, what we get is one, one, zero, da, 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 zero, zero. And the result is in 30 Q zero. And of course, if it's in 30 Q zero, the decimal points here, this is one, this is two, one plus two gives us three. So this represents our three. And so if we don't do anything, if we don't do any of the shifting by ourselves, like I just did by casting that number, the result isn't incorrect by the processor, but the interpretation is wrong. And so you either have to, you either have two choices, you use this nice QMath library, which will automatically do this shifting for you, or you have to make sure that you only add numbers of the same Q type, or you have to make sure you cast a number that's in a, a, a different Q type to the same Q type before you do the addition. And so the beauty of TI is they take care of all that for you if you use their QMath library. So you don't have to worry about, like if you wanted to add a 30Q1 to a 31Q0, well, you just tell them to add those two numbers and they take care of the shifting for you. So I know that was a really kind of a long-winded answer to that, but this, this is the trouble that you get in in fixed point if you don't understand the number system and you don't understand that you can't um, just arbitrarily add two different Q formats. You will definitely get the incorrect result. The number will be right by the bare math on the hardware. The, the binary addition will be right, but it'll be wrong in, in interpretation. Okay, um, great question, Richard. And, and this gets even worse when you do multiplication. Uh, level shifting a 30Q1 number could change a positive to a negative. It must check for that. Okay, so diving deep into the QMath library, I am not 100% sure. Um, actually, I am sure. I don't think it does check. I, I don't. Um, I think that's part of your job in the design is to make sure that at nothing happens. So level shifting at 31 30 q let me let me just think about what you're getting at here 30 q one number could change a positive to a negative i don't left shifting Let me think, if you're always shifting to the most significant, that means the number that is can represent smaller numbers is always shifting to the right. And it's a shift right with, with um, it, I don't think it will. I don't think it will. Cause you're only, you're always shifting right. You're not shifting left, but I, I do get what you're getting at. I, I understand your point, but uh, I believe the way they've written their library, and I could be wrong, but I believe the way they've written it is they always want to keep the most significant bit. You don't want to lose the bigger part of the number. So when you're combining two numbers, it always right shifts the number that is in that will represent a smaller number, if that makes sense. But what I will say is if, if you want to double check, you can go check at their defined statements. They're actually, they're just, they're literally, the way they do this is, um, it's something like this, yeah. Their defined statements are really simple. So 
then this is your number and it's a shift right by Q and you define the Q format. And so um, that's all they're doing. <laughs> I don't, there's no other checks. They're, they're done in defined statements. So, so good question. Um, I'll wait a couple more minutes. If there's more questions, uh, please let me know. Sorry about that, I was muted, thank you. Um, so did, this is a great question, Jose, and I could probably spend 50 minutes talking about this in one lecture. It is a fantastic question, and it's probably one of the more oftenly confused things that happen when we're trying to do control loops for the first time on processors. But, but let me talk about fixed point processor first. And what I mean about fixed point processor is there's no FP, no, no FPU, there's no floating point unit, which means that um, any F, if you have floating point, you can still do floating point on it, but if you have any floating point operations, they use a library. Okay, what does a library mean? A library is just, is essentially just code. It's C code that's already compiled and they're pre-compiled functions to do, um, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, et cetera. And these pre-compiled um, libraries make use of the limited instruction set available to them on that fixed point processor. So for instance, like an addition may take, and I, I'm just, guessing here, but it's on the order of 10 to 50 cycles of the CPU to just complete one addition. Whereas if you were doing a fixed point addition, it would take one cycle. And so this may not seem all that bad, but when you look at filters, all they are are multiplications and additions. And if you're doing a lot of them, 10 to 50 cycles per edition, and then even more for multiplication, adds up very quickly, which means you'd be spending all your time or more time than you have doing just a simple calculation for floating point. And so when you don't have a floating point unit, it is strongly advised to just run in fixed point. As long as you, you can do your design properly, you can run in fixed point, you just have to run, you have to design the control loop properly and your number system appropriately for that. Okay, because fixed point, most of the instructions, like a multiplication will be one cycle, an addition slash subtraction will be one cycle. Um, it won't be for floating point. It'll be multiple instructions to do that type of math. So once you, when you have a processor that has an FPU unit, 
for instance, I'm just using this as an example because I know they have it in the Delfino and I uh, we use a lot of TI Delfinos here. This has an FPU and it has multiplication, subtraction, addition, division. It even has, and these are in one instruction cycle. Actually division is eight, but generally division is a lot anyways. But this is off the top of my head, this is one cycle. This is one cycle for a floating point number. This is one cycle. Actually, this is four. That's pretty fast too. Four cycles for division is 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 fast, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and so, if you have this, and there, and this comes at a cost, right? I mean, these processors are significantly more expensive than just a fixed point or even a sixteen bit fixed point. So, it comes with a cost, but then you can run in floating point. And so these instructions run much quicker and you can run in floating point. And so I think that that is kind of a, a short answer to your question. But if you're ever compiling something for a processor and you use floating point numbers, and it's really easy, <laughs> all my students do this. You just write float, right? This is fantastic. I can represent any number I want and I can start doing math with it. A you know, A equals A squared and do this. But, but if you don't have an FPU, th this, this simple line of C code, sorry, I wrote it wrong, A equals A squared, this simple line of C code may expand into, you know, one to 200 instructions on the CPU. Whereas if you had a floating point, this may be, you know, one instruction for the multiplication and maybe one instruction to store it back into the memory location uh, where A is. So uh, very easy to goof up, but uh, hopefully I answered this in, a, in an appropriate fashion, Jose. Please let me know if you want more elaboration on that. Jose, thank you for the suggestion. This is absolutely one of the ones I want to develop. Um, this one I don't have at the current moment, but it definitely would be a very, very, very um, good one. And so um, I will definitely going to add that one. Um, it's spe specifically too with showing how the instruction, how the C code compiles into the instructions, because I think from a, a, a learning standpoint, if you really want to understand what I'm saying, you have to have C code side by side with what the compiler output for assembly so that you can see that, oh, this is what he means by a library call and then walk through how many instructions actually get inserted for a simple multiplication when you don't have an F FPU versus when I have an FPU and I do a, an addition or something, oh, look, it's one instruction. It takes one cycle. And also in addition to this, what I want to add to is just briefly look at the instruction set on the assembly so that as, as a consumer or a student or somebody in the industry, you understand how to look up very quickly what each instruction consumes in terms of clock cycles. So, there's a whole manual for every processor that'll give the instruction, it'll list all the bits, the configuration, et cetera, but also list how long it takes to run. And that's really an important point when you're talking about a, a control loop that needs to run very fast and multiple times. So, but good point, Jose, thank you. That's, that's definitely in the works. It's a very good stuff to add. All right, I'm gonna wait about one more minute to, uh, let any other questions float in and then I'll, I'll go to a, another one that I'm working on that's definitely incomplete.
All right, cool. So we don't have any more questions. I am going to go to my, I have two more. This one is developed a little bit in PDF and then I have one only in MATLAB. So we're going to go over two more. And uh, again, this is kind of a trial by fire. It's not complete. There's probably mistakes like we found earlier, but we'll go through it. Please give me any uh, feedback input on this and uh, um, we'll answer any questions as we go through. Okay, so this one is going to be about floating point, how it's represented. Um, and specifically what I'm doing here is targeting 32-bit. Most of the stuff, like if you're in MATLAB nowadays on your computer, everything's in, in double. They call them double floating point. That just means you're at 64 bits for representing a floating point. And you can push it up to 128 if you want. I think it's a, a long double floating point number. But uh, when you're on, on um, process that go on a computer. Um, um, yeah, Eric, that is a great resource, a DSP guide. That's a fantastic one. I've used that in the past. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, I should add that to my references list. So thank you for that. Um, when you're working on uh, processors in general, um, you know, you, you're going to get 32 bit floating point units. Um, I don't think there are any out there that exist, at least meant for power electronics or 64. I don't even, you really don't need 64 bit for power electronics, at least for control loops. But um, anyways, this is targeted at 32 bit, which is what I'm seeing at least in the industry right now in terms of what's out there for FPUs. So we'll be targeting specifically 32. Okay. So what's, what's kind of the pros and cons of this? Um, you have variable precision. So essentially the point can move. Um, with that, it gives you an extremely large domain. It means you can, you can represent a large domain. When you're in fixed point, you, you, you fix a point, you, you're stuck to that range. You can't go outside of that range, but here you can. The cons are we lose precision every mathematical operation. And I can show you some of the cons of floating point. I think one of the large misconceptions is that floating point is better than fixed point. <laughs> and I would argue against that. I would say, they both have their pros and cons. You really should understand them and um, understand their pros, but also their cons. And, and I, I will definitely show you at least one con that uh, I'm very aware of for floating point. Okay, so yeah, some notes about this. It's really fast if you have a floating point. If you don't have a floating point unit on there, of course your compiler is gonna compile everything to a library, which is gonna make all your, all your math operation is extremely slow on a cycle by cycle basis. Okay, so let's just talk about the representation of um, um, numbers in, um, in uh, floating point. So in 32 bits, you have a sign bit, which is the most significant bit. And then what you have is 23 minus 31, what are these? Yeah, I always forget this, it's 22. So you have 23, you have, it looks like nine, nine for the exponent, and we'll go over what the exponent is, and then you have 23 bits for the mantissa. And this is 23, so I should put a 22 here and make this a little bit easier on myself. Okay, let's see, 23, 24, 4, 6, 2, 8. Whoops, this should be 8. Anyways, I can do math, I swear. Anyways, so we have these bits for the exponent, the sine, and the mantissa. Okay, so what is what? All right, so the exponent is a number that is raised to the 2, and it has a bias. Okay, so think of this as a number that can be raised anywhere between minus 128 all the way up to 127, okay? All right, and so that's the exponent. And then we have the mantissa. All right, the mantissa is interesting. This is, so we're in floating point. So the mantissa has a, a expected one. This is really confusing. So you have 22 bits, right? All the way up to the zeroth bit. There's actually a 23rd bit, sorry, a 24th bit that you get for free. It's always assumed 
that there is a one in this high th position that's not marked, which is really interesting. So you're going to have one point something, and 22 starts here. This is a 22th bit position all the way to the zeroth bit position. All right, so you always have this one here. It's just assumed. It's not actually shown up here anywhere, okay? And so you can put, you know, any number you want here after the one. So it's 1.22 bit position. So this is a fractional. Assume 22 to zero is a fractional, okay? And so in order to convert this to um, an actual value, you have this one, which is assumed here, and then you have this sum from one to 23 of all the bit positions and they're all fractional bits. Okay, I know it's gonna be really confusing at the start, but let's see if we can, let me switch to, um, actually, hold on, let's do this example first. Okay, so the question is, what's how, how do we represent one, okay, in a, in a single precision 32 bit floating point number? Okay, how are we gonna do this? All right, so, Let's do, looking at this equation, um, I want to raise this 2 to the 0. I want this 2 to be 2 to 0. So this exponent I need here needs to be 127. So that I have 127 minus 127. And this E is this, whatever number is here in green. You have 8 or 9 bits for the exponent. Okay, so if you look over here, what do I have here? If you add this up, this is the one position, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and 64. And so this would be the 128th eight position. And so you see that I have all ones below it. So if I just subtract one from 128, this number is indeed 127, okay, for my exponent. All right, cool, so I'm gonna write this out point by point. So I have, oh, and my sign bit is zero. So I have minus one to the zero, times 2 to the 127 minus 127 because there's a bias on the exponent. And then I have times this whole mantissa. Okay, check this out. The whole mantissa is 0. But remember, there's that implicit 1. So this is 1.0 and a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, etc. All right, so to write this out, this is here like this. Okay, so we have minus 1 to the 0, which we know is just 1. We have 2 to the 0, which is also 1, and then we have times 1. So this is how we represent 1. All right, so <laughs> I know this is really, really confusing, but this exponent is what allows us to move the, um, the point anywhere we want. And the mantissa is always 23 bits of precision. And so we can represent 23 bits at a really large number or 23 bits at a really small number. And we can control where that lands by just adjusting this exponent. Now, you can see this number is quite complicated in how it's represented. So if you're starting to think, how are we gonna do addition? This is why you need a floating point um, uh, unit. You cannot do straight up addition using a, a typical adder, a binary adder. It will not work. That's not how this number is represented. So that's why you need a floating point unit to do one cycle instructions of addition, multiplication, subtraction, et cetera. Okay, let's try a slightly more complicated example. Let's try to represent 10 in single precision floating point. Okay, how are we gonna do this? Okay, so let's take a look at what we have here. If we look at our numbers here, let's look at the mantissa first. We have a one here and a one here. So let's just do the math again quick. This was this position is the 128th, so we have 128. This is a, a one and a two. So we have 128 plus two. So our exponent, our exponent is equal to 130. All right, that's gonna be good. Our sine bit is zero. So we have minus one to the zero times two to the 130 
minus 127 and then times this one point and we got to figure out the point. So the one remember is always implied. It's always there even though it's not stored in the number because the, the point's here but it's just completely implied. So this is one half and this is one quarter. Okay, so this is 1.25. All right, let's see if we actually represented 10 properly. All right, um, so we know that one minus one of zero is one. So this is two to the three, which is eight. So times eight times 1.25. Okay, this should equal 10. So we have the correct representation of 10. Okay, so that's what 10 would look like in floating point. Okay, and so now we'll go to a really high number. Oh, by the way, sorry, I put these in. Let me just step back. It's really difficult if you look at these numbers on the processor, it just in memory locations, because they really don't have much meaning. But if you looked at the number one, which is the representation of this number just in binary and in hex, that's what one looks like. 3F800000. Doesn't mean much to me, but if you're looking at raw, um, that's what it looks like. Same goes for 10 in single precision. This is 4120000. Doesn't mean much, but it's what that number represents. And then let's go back to our example here. Now we're gonna try 100 million and just show you that this floating point moves so we can represent a wide range of numbers, which we couldn't before. Okay, so let's check out what we got here. Let's look at the exponent again. So we have zero for sine. We have a one here, so this is one, two, four. This is eight, 16. Um, we have 3264, 128. So I gotta do this mental math really quick and add up what our exponent is so that we get this right. So we have 8, 8, 16, 22, 23, 2, 4, 5, I think 153. Eh, I hope I did my math right, we'll check. So this exponent looks to be 153. And now we have a really large exponent. Oh, wait, this is gonna be hard to do. All right, so how do we interpret the mantissa? Okay, this isn't too bad. But remember, we always have that implied one. So it's going to be one point. And then I did the math here, but this is correct. But let me just show you how you get it if you want to do it by hand. So the first position, this would be one half. This would be um, one fourth. This would be, yeah, I got to write this a little bit better. So this is one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one 18th, 132nd, and so on and so forth. And you would add these all up. And if you added those all up, you would get this 1.49776. Okay, so, so we have that number, 1.490. Now, spare you the rest. We're going to multiply this by negative 1 to the 0, which we know is 1. And we're going to multiply this by 2 to the 153 minus 127. Now, if you do that, it's not clear here, but if you do it in MATLAB to double check the math, you should get 100 million. And so you can see here very simply that um, we, we can represent a vast, a wide array of numbers um, with this system using a variable floating point. And so it looks like this right here is an air carryover error. So we'll just cross that over. Okay, so that's kind of representation. Um, let me pause for a second and let you guys, if you want, ask questions. So please go ahead um, just about the representation. Then I'll talk a little bit about some math that I've written here. Um, if you pause for like two or three minutes.
Okay, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to get any questions. It's okay. So let's talk about adding numbers in floating point, and you can see why you don't can't use a binary adder. So let's try to add 1 to 10 in single precision floating point. To do the way the representative memory, um, the numbers must have a common exponent in order to be able to add them. So what that means is you would like to get a common exponent, and then once you do, you can just straight up add the mantissas like you would in a binary adder. Um, and then you have to store it back to whatever the most significant representation was. Okay. Let's try this out. See if I can follow my own notes. All right. So trying to remember here what I have. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so here's the representation for one. So remember our, our, our exponent was 127, so it was 127 minus 127. That gives us the zero. Our whole mantissa was zero, and then there was that implied one. So it's one dot in the whole thing was all zeros, right? So that was our one, is our floating point. And then over here, our exponent was 130. So this was 130 minus, remember there's always a bias of 127. So that gives us a three and our mantissa was 1.0100. So this is just, just so you know, this is our representation in, in um, floating point. And so as you can see right now, they do not have a common exponent, right? Let's just highlight it. common exponents here. Zero and three, they're not common. So what you have to do <laughs> in order to actually add these numbers, the mantissas, you need to get them in a common exponent. And so what you do is you go to the most, you always go to the most significant one because you don't want to chop off your number. You don't want to chop off the most significant bits or the parts of your number. Okay, so that being said, what you're going to do here is you're going to shift the one to a different representation. Okay, you're going to shift it up by three. So when you shift up this exponent here by three, you need to shift the mantissa down by three, which is why you have one times two to the minus three, which is 0 0.125 or better known as one eighth. So this however you want to call it, shift up by three common exponents. Okay, so now that they're common, we can pull out the two to the three, right? They're common. So this is common and we can pull it out in front and guess what? You can go ahead and you can add your two mantises, right? So you have 0 0.125 plus 1.25. So you should get 5, 7, 3, 1, 1, 3, 7, 5. If I can do math correct, let's we'll see. Okay, so what do you get? Yep, here's where me, I'm pulling this out. And of course you have this here. Here's my 1.375 and this should be 11. Okay, so that's how you would actually add the numbers, the process of actually doing them. And so <laughs> what you have to do when you're actually writing code, what the floating point unit would do is check this exponent and see what's the difference between the two and take the one with the lower exponent and shift it up to match the higher one. Once it did that, it would then go ahead and add the two mantises together and store back the most significant exponent. And of course, maintaining your sign. And so that's how you do addition here. You can see it's, it's a lot more involved than binary, right? And you also see that you can't just use a binary adder. Um, and you can also see that these steps that I'm taking here to find the common exponent and then to shift and then to add the mantissa and store it back, 
would be multiples, if you didn't have a floating point unit, would be multiple um, addition, shift, store back type instructions on a fixed point processor to implement a floating point addition. And thus, that's why the library call takes a long time to do an addition if you don't have an FPU. If you had an FPU, it would do this in one cycle. Okay, so now you see that. Now let's talk a little bit about precision here. This is gonna be interesting. So we're going to try to add one and 100 million. And let's see if I, oh, I don't have this in here. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, let me think about this for one second. Yeah, I'm going to stop here because I'm not fully prepared to do this. No, actually, no, we can do this. So what we do here is th this is the most significant one. So what you got to do here is take this and shift it up. You got to shift it up by 26. So you're going to have 2 to the 26 times 1. Sorry, not 1. So this, again, was the mantissa. So what if we shift the exponent up, from 0 to 26, that means we need to shift down the mantissa by 26. Okay, and actually, this is a really good point. I, I, so what's going to happen here is we're going to have 1 times 2 to the minus 26. That's what we're going to do here. This is going to be our mantissa. All right. I'm actually going to pause here because I don't have this in notes, but I'm going to ask you guys a question. Is this a problem? Is this 1 times 2 to the minus 26 in the mantissa a problem? Uh, give yourself two or three minutes. Think about it and let me know if you, you think this is a problem. Or if you have a question about what I'm asking, let me know. So Richard says, yes, downshift causes loss of all precision. Well, yeah, when you shift to the right, you're losing lower bits. But look at this one. I'm shifting to the right 26. Look at the length of your mantissa. Yeah, Mantis is only 23 bits, right? Mantis is only 23 bits. That is bad news. So if I shifted this down, actually, if I did this addition, if I added one in 100 million, what would I get? Yes, that's correct, Morteza. You can't represent all the digits. So what would I get? Yep, Richard, you get 100 million. 100 million plus one equals 100 million. And so... This, I, I, it's obviously, I haven't finished this note set and I'm still developing it, but this is one of the cons. I think, that I love this point, it's very simple, but I think people want to go to, like people who are inexperienced, I should say, they're like, they want to go from fixed to floating point, think that floating point can solve every problem or it's the best, but um, that's not the, that's not correct. Um, here's one example. Um, this addition completely loses precision. In fact, this addition spits out the incorrect answer. And you can even do this in MATLAB. Um, you can call single around 100 million and call single around one and then add them <laughs> and watch you get 100 million back. So very interesting. Um, but yeah, this is to just drive the point through that floating point is not the the holy grail of number systems, it's a number system and it has its pros and it has its cons too. Okay, so Eric has a question. Can you accurately represent 100 million in floating point? Yeah, so Richard, you have a great point. Add all numbers from one to 100 million starting at one and working your way up and then do the opposite. Then compare 
at all numbers from 100 million starting at 100 million working your way down to one yeah absolutely <laughs> I, I, you'd be shocked at what you get in fact i am going to write this down this is a very interesting point you made richard um i might save that for uh it's a very good educational exercise actually so thank you for that And then Eric, I'll, I'll get back to your question here one second. I'm not ignoring you, just gonna jot this down. Okay, so, yes, all right, yes. So can you actually represent that accurately? Yeah, that's a very good point, and so, um, the answer obviously is no, you can't accurately represent 100 million. Um, let me think if that is. Let me just double check that in MATLAB. It's been a while since I set that one up and Yeah, I believe you're correct, Eric. Yep, that's correct. Um, I got to get my MATLAB script set up for that properly, but um, I think I have that. But yeah, no, that's that's looking correct. Okay, um, other questions, please let me know. I'm going to pause here for a couple more minutes and let you formulate any more questions that you have. Meanwhile, I'm going to look for this MATLAB script here.
Okay, it looks like we don't have any further questions on this. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this and go on to my last bit here, which, wait, hold on. Oh yeah, yeah, Richard, you're you're exactly correct. So you have a, a mantissa that's 23 bits. And so you can roughly calculate the precision which floats around whatever your exponents at but yeah essentially you have you have a, a number that you're multiplying by some two to the exponent and so you get one point out to six or seven digits which is correct so let me do that Yeah, so like if you do two to the minus 23, you get 1.19, et cetera, et cetera, e to the minus seven. And so you, yeah, you do get about seven decimals of precision and that point can move wherever, but it's about seven, seven digits, that's correct. And so 100 million plus one, that goes beyond your seven digits or decimals of precision. Okay. Uh, difference between numbers becomes larger as the numbers become larger. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's correct. That's definitely correct. And so that would be one, one difference between your floating point and fixed point. So I think what you mean is difference, the Delta, the step between each, number you can accurately represent changes as you go higher in the number system versus lower. Whereas in fixed point, you have a fixed point. So your Delta is fixed. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, Richard, I agree. Yeah, I'm just looking, Eric, uh, real quick at uh, your tables that you're referring to. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I think you're talking about fixed point table. Actually, I might get the right one. Oh, no, no, no. I see what you're pointing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is a really, a really fantastic little diagram that explains what you're talking about. Okay, awesome. I think if there's no other, these are, thank you for the comments and, and, the, uh, and the, the, the references and all that. I really appreciate that. It's always good to get feedback from a consumer um, to tell me what I'm missing or what should be added. These are fantastic things to add. So I appreciate that. Um, I think I'm gonna move on. You can, yes, and to, um, um, 
my last thing, which is I have a script for another PLL. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Um, but no, a one that you would see more in the field. And so I think I'm going to start off by um, kind of sketching out what this would look like and then kind of explaining the MATLAB code and then we'll answer any questions regarding that. Uh, let's see here. All right, yeah, I think you can see this. Okay, so we'll go over kind of this PLL here. And let me get my script up here. I need it for help. Okay, so we're going to talk about a, a more practical single phase PLL. And so you saw kind of a simple block diagram last time, but this is one that um, I'm t I've taken this from some papers and from TI. Um, it's just one of the common ones out there. So last time I used kind of a, a state diagram to a state flow diagram to kind of implement the phase frequency detector. This time I'm actually going to just use a multiplier. And so what we're gonna have coming in to our PLL is the voltage. And so it's gonna have some magnitude in V and some phase angle theta. Okay, and of course this is gonna come in as a sine wave, so it'll fluctuate in time like this. And so we're gonna multiply that with our estimate of cosine of V angle. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And so what we're going to do first here is pass this through a notch filter. And so this is something that uh, Richard had mentioned earlier, and I'll talk about this in depth, what this is, why it is. But if we look at the gain, it's going to look like this. And this is where the notch is. And essentially, we're going to block a frequency. We're going to notch at two times grid frequency. So essentially we just wanna get rid of that component, whatever is in there. Okay, and what we're gonna do then is pass that through to a controller. And this will be passed through again. We'll just call it um, KO for now. It's not imperative what this value is. This will go into a summing block and we'll add in our center frequency. So this is a frequency we generally think the grid will be and we're trying to lock around. The output of the controller will add whatever delta omega it is, how close or far away it is from omega. Once we have omega, we can go ahead and integrate this. We integrate this, we get our phase, okay? And then what we'll do is we'll pass this into two blocks sine and cosine, so it's cosine and a sine. And the one that we'll actually pass back and compare with our input is the cosine. But we'll have this available. And the reason we want sine and cosine available is for later on in other control loops and power electronics, you, you want to use like the PARC transform or the DQ. So you would send this off to the DQ, ABC to DQ transformation. So that's why you want the cosine and sine of theta. All right, so this is just a general block diagram. This looks a lot different than what we did last time, but that's okay. Um, the multiplier is really easy to do. Um, so you don't have to implement a state machine. If you're in fixed point, you literally multiply. If you're in floating point and you have a floating point unit, you can just literally multiply and that is your phase detector slash um, error creator. So you don't have to create anything special for that. Okay, so this is just the basic structure of this PLL. The building blocks are almost the same. I mean, this is our phase detector before it was that state machine. Here's a multiplier. Last time we didn't have a notch filter, but since this multiplication produces a component at twice the grid frequency, we don't want it, so we get rid of it. This is our controller. We had a controller last time, and then we have an integrator and a sine and cosine. So the structure is generally the same. 
So what I'm going to do now is hop over to my um, MATLAB code and talk a little bit about the notch filter and show you where I put it and how to implement it and all that good stuff. <laughs> So let's see here. I need to swap this over to MATLAB. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is to make this where my zoom go here. Okay, so now we're looking at the whole screen. So what I'm gonna do first is talk about this, uh, this notch filter here. And so let me get this thing running and then, okay. So I built a notch filter. Let's just take a look at this. There's a beautiful command. Um, there's a beautiful command on um, MATLAB called FreckZ. R-F-E-Q-Z that will give you essentially the um, body plot, if you will, of a digital filter. And I'll explain what's going on here in a second. So Richard has a quick question about, do we need a mod on the angle? Um, when we're in MATLAB here so far, no, we don't. But when you're actually in software, you absolutely do. Like when you're on firmware, like you can't infinitely add um, um, with the integrator. So yeah, essentially once you go over two pi, you just subtract two pi Richard. So yeah, you should throw a mod on there. I just left that out here for brevity, but yeah, I definitely need a mod. Just keep that thing between zero and two pi, especially when you're in firmware or, 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 uh, you're in a real application. Okay. So here's the output of our notch filter. And <laughs> if you look at it, all I'm going to focus on is the gain. Essentially it looks like it's zero DB or one everywhere. But you see there's a little notch over here. And so let me go ahead and zoom in and, and show you where that's at. Before I zoom in though, when you run FreckZ, you get the Bode plot essentially in a normalized frequency span here on the x-axis. And let's just talk about this for a second. You go from zero to one. And this one is actually one of the Nikus frequency. So if let's say we're running this uh, digital controller at 50 kilohertz. The Nyquist is half of that. That'd be 25 kilohertz. So this one here would be one times 25, or in other words, 25 kilohertz. That's what this represents. And so we have this notch and it's way over here. So let's go look at this and see what we are doing. And I did design this for 50 kilohertz, meaning the, the digital controller is running 50 kilohertz. And so here, my filter is and you see the notch i mean it drops off here it's dropping off pretty drastically and this is at let's see if i can get a data tip on here yeah it is at let me zoom back in there because it's hard to see it is at 0 0.004 and that's a normalized frequency so in order to extract what frequency this is actually at i need to take zero 0 0.004 and multiply it by my nice crisp frequency. So I'm gonna multiply that by 25 kilohertz. And we get 100 hertz. So this is meant for a 50 hertz application. So two times the grid frequency is 100 hertz. So essentially what this notch will do is filter out anything at 100 hertz, given that you're sampling at 50 kilohertz in this digital filter. Okay, so that, that's a really simple notch filter. And I don't have the derivation completely set up yet for the coefficients um, that will come in the PDF. So it's not here. And, but I don't have it. I have it derived, but I, I can't show it to you explicitly because I just have the equations written down. But essentially, this gives you a notch at that at frequency. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and run some, let's see, do I have my Okay, so what I'm going to do here next is show you the input to my PLL. Now this is normalized. Okay, so it goes from one to negative one. That's what I mean by normalized. And here's my input to this um, 
into this um, controller. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do is run this for one complete loop here. Yeah. And I apologize, I don't have everything derived out yet for all the numbers and how you get this controller gain. I, I, I assure you it's very similar to what I did in the previous um, talk. But what I wanna do is show you the locking mechanism here. So here's red, red's the output. That's essentially cosine, sorry, that is sine theta. So this is what we think theta is. And you can see right at the beginning, of course, we have some error. So here's one cycle gone, here's two cycles gone. And about three or four cycles, we're pretty well locked in. And if we look at the error, the error is the difference between the actual theta and what theta is, or, or rather, if you will, um, the difference between these two waveforms, the red and the blue. And so you can see we have an error, but this is just startup and then we converge to zero. So this means that we have locked on to our um, incoming sine wave. Now, let me see if I can plot some other things just to give you a little bit of information on what is what, is what when we look at this. So I'm gonna try to plot the output of the multiplier. Yeah, okay. So remember the multiplier is our, so it's, it's essentially generating our error. So if you look at this, it's actually pretty hard to understand because when you multiply two sine waves together, what you get is a DC offset. That DC offset is actually the, the difference. It's the cosine of the difference between the two angles of each sine wave. And then you also get a harmonic at the second or two times the grid frequency, which is what you're always seeing here. So we don't, this is always gonna be here, even when they're in phase, the second harmonic. And so we wanna eliminate that. We don't wanna pass that through our controller. Our controller always think there is air. And so that's why we have the notch filter. But the DC offset, which is, I admit, is not easy to see here, but it was that red error plot. Let's see if I can bring that up again quick. And uh, destroy my other one. Okay, so this red error plot is actually the DC offset of that signal that I just plotted and it ruined it. Okay, let me bring the other one up again. Okay, so we have our two waveforms. So this red one, if you looked at just the DC component of this signal, that's what you get the error. So we have to get rid of that because we're multiplying. We're always gonna have that second harmonic in this waveform. We have to get rid of it. And that's what the notch filter is for. And so let me go ahead and plot for you the uh, output of the notch filter then. And so you can see how this signal comes in and essentially we get rid of the second harmonic. All right, so where's my notch here? And you can see there's the output of my notch. And actually, just to be clear in this, um, we actually double notch in, the, in this code, which means I use the same notch twice in a row. So it's a notch uh, I, just so I can filter more at 100 hertz. So I pass the error into the first notch. The output of the first notch goes as an input to the second notch, which is the same exact filter and the output of the second notch then goes to the controller. So essentially this is the error that's fed into the controller after it's gone through a notch filter. And you wanna drive this to zero, which essentially it is at zero. All right, let's see if we can look at the output then of our controller. This should be the output of our controller. This, remember, will drive to whatever the deviation is of your frequency between the, the center frequency and the actual frequency. So it'll be zero if your actual frequency is zero. And here it is. So you can see this thing will drive to zero. And this is in radians, by the way. And so eventually this drives to um, zero. And that's because our actual grid frequency is equal to the, the center frequency. Okay, um, so that's the output of that. And let's see, I wanna also, let me see if I can induce a transient quick 
I have it set up for that. I think I do, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is introduce a transient here and see if I can um, look at what the output looks like due to that transient. All right, yeah, so here's gonna be my new input. The only thing that changed is we're going along, we're going along, and then boom, you see right about halfway, you see a phase jump. This is a really ridiculous condition that would never happen in the grid. So it's just not possible with the physics behind it, but it, it really just, it simulates kind of a worst case input to your PLL. All of a sudden you immediately jump phase and lose lock and how well does your, your PLL respond? And so I'm gonna pass this as an input now to this and see what we get. All right, so of course there's gonna be a transient and you're gonna have some time between it, but you can see essentially we were locked back here and then boom, we had that phase jump. Blue just jumped from zero to pi by four. So we had a 90 degree phase jump. And then you can see, well, we lost lock. We're generating some error. We're trying to catch up, but give it two to three, four cycles of the grid and we're pretty much locked back on. So that's just one way to test the, um, test how well your um, PLL is, is, works against transients to both phase. You can test it against voltage. Um, you can test it against frequency, um, steps, et cetera. So this is a more practical PLL that you would see in hardware, like in a solar application for a single phase. It has a notch filter, you're using a multiplier as a phase detector, you're using a simple PI controller as your control, and the rest is cosine and sine of, of things. So, okay, I don't have any more on this. This was really a trial by fire in this one. I, I'm just trying to develop this. This was taken from some of the stuff that T High has developed for some of their C code, and it works well. Um, there's other ways to do PLLs. These are just two different ways that I've shown. Um, I'm gonna add a third one later, but I, I have nothing developed for it at this point but um, the third one essentially uh, creates a quadrature access so when you only have single phase you only have one input so you only have alpha if you will how do you create beta we well, can create beta with a phase delay or a double integrator or there's other methods but um, how do you create a synchronous reference frame when you only have one input so doing it that way is a, another interesting way to create a pll for a single phase application um, I'm going to pause here for about five minutes, give you time to ask some questions, and, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. So thank you. Yeah, Richard. So that's the that's the the one of the ones I'm going to develop. Um, 
I actually have some code for it, but it's even cruder than this and it's working. But um, yeah, that's an excellent article. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. Yeah, Eric, maybe I didn't and I just uh, took it for granted that everybody knew what PLL is. So let me, I will add that as a note to myself to go back and check and make sure I spell that out so that uh, students actually know what I mean when I say PLL. So my apologies. Um, first time through, thank you for pointing that out. And I'll add a note, make sure I uh, remedy that. Thank you. I agree, Eric. I agree. <laughs> and uh, Eric, uh, if you don't mind, could you share your um, affiliation and your position within your affiliation? Thanks for sharing, Eric. Yeah, if you have any, uh, well, Eric, Richard, and the rest of you, if you have more comments um, outside of this to suggestions, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, you can send me an email. <clears throat> I'll drop my email again here. Matt Marquette, you can look me up too if you can't find it. But um, yeah, my, I'm going to be running this class for the first time this fall, and there's a couple more modules I'm looking to develop, but I also I'd like to get this up to about 60 modules. There's definitely some holes, you know, that I would like to um, fill that I, I don't have done. Um, but uh, if there's stuff you'd like me to hit on, so I've made some notes um, from you guys, um, but 
if there's something I'm missing that I really like, it looks like some, there was some, you know, math earlier that I haven't got done completely on the number systems and talking about how they compile and stuff like that. But if there are more beyond what you've, you've told me already, please send them to me. I'd, I'd love to, to hear them and, and make this better. I'd like, I'd like to move this from 30 modules up to 60 and try to cover everything you would ever need in order to be able to design digital control for power electronics. So, uh, all right, I'm gonna stick around for you know, another seven minutes or so, answer any questions that you have. Please let me know, and thanks. So we got a question about Scilab. Um, you know, at the beginning when I was a fresh graduate from Minnesota, I mean, I was pretty married to um, MATLAB, meaning I think I only did stuff in MATLAB. I did uh, all my math in MATLAB and I did the, I used the power sim toolbox to do power electronics. And then once I kind of graduated and was out on my own and working my first job, I, I've really become, I've tried to become to the best of my ability, really application or software agnostic. So um, what that means is I generally just try to find whatever software best fits the bill. And so having said that, I do a lot of stuff in MATLAB still, but um, a lot of times, especially if I'm doing it as consulting for somebody, they don't have MATLAB, I'll make sure that it, it works with Octave, right? That's kind of an open source implementation of it. I don't know Scilab that well. I've heard of it and it looks very similar to MATLAB, but I, I don't know it enough that I could give you my opinion of it. But there are tons, for instance, what I've seen a lot of people move to now is Python because Python's free and there's all these different additional libraries you can add in for number systems, for plotting, all that good stuff. Um, in terms of digital control, if I really need it, what, I end up just comp writing the C code and then compiling it and calling the C code externally, you know, from MATLAB or Plex or whatever software package I'm using to simulate it. And the reason I do that is because if I write C code, then I can actually control the number system to mimic um, what you would see on a microcontroller or a processor or whatever you're running it on. So like I can make all the math be in in 32, which would be, you know, running fixed point 32, or I can make it run in 16 bit 30, 16 bit fixed point by just writing the C code with 32 bit um, sign, or sorry, with 16 bit signed integers, et cetera. If I want to run in single precision floating point, then you know, I can write C code using single precision floating point, et cetera. So, um, I, I can't really comment on Scilab, but I, I try to keep things, um, try to keep things as, I try not to tie myself or marry myself to one software. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question a little bit, but all right. I was sticking around for a couple more minutes. Please send questions as you have them. Um, and, uh, I'll be glad to answer them. So Eric's got a question about what hardware do you use? Could you be, I use a lot of hardware. Could you specify what you mean by hardware? Yeah, a lot of hardware. 
So Oh, okay, so um, I kind of follow what you're asking here. Um, okay, so evaluation board that you use or are building from scratch. Okay, yeah, sorry, there's a, I got an answer for that. Just give me one second. I got to pull something up here. So, All right, I'm gonna go ahead and Eric, I'm going to share my screen and answer your question. All right, so I think you're talking about from a hardware perspective, the computing part of things. Oh shoot, did I share the right one? I think I, I think you guys can see my screen, I hope. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I, I love this Delphina launch pad. Um, there's, there's two big reasons. One, it's got a lot of different hardware in the processor for doing a lot of functionality. In fact, in fact, this is actually a dual core and it's actually a four core. So it actually has four processors. It's, it has two complete processors, normal processors, and then it has two control law accelerators. Control law accelerator is just their um, marketing name for a really dumbed down processor that is just meant to run control loops in the background. And so with this thing, it's really cool. You can have one main processor, the powerful one, just hand off the control loop to the CLA. The CLA will run the control loop indefinitely in the background while you can do all your tasking in your main processor. For instance, you can do all your communication, you can do all your calculations, your input and output, et cetera. This board is, the other reason is this board is super cheap. It is 20 or $30. I mean, I buy these at in like 10 packs because <laughs> they're so cheap. And at the same time, they are so powerful. Um, it's also got a floating point unit. So if you want to show students what, you know, the difference is between running fixed point and floating point, you can do that on one, one um, board. Now this is just essentially has a bunch of IO headers on it. So you can't directly, oh, and it's also got a debugger. That's the other thing. So kind of in the top image here, that's like a built-in debugger. So you don't have to buy another part to debug this and start compiling code. You, you spend 20 to $30 on one of these um, and the, the developer, which is called Code Composer Studio is free. You can compile code for this in 20 to $30. So it's, a, for, in my viewpoint, I'm biased because I use a lot of these, but uh, the, this is like the best of the best right here, for, especially for the, the money you're paying. Um, you get a lot of power and a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, to answer kind of the second part, um, in terms of evaluation board, um, geez, I don't know if I have a picture of that somewhere. Um, give me one second. I think I have a photo of what, yeah, to answer that second part here. Let's see if I can do this here. Okay, let me share with you this guy. Okay, here's one of our popular setups. Hopefully you can see this screen, but I'm gonna zoom in on one specific area. If you actually see this launch pad, this is the 20 to $30 part um, that we buy. Um, it's got all the functionality on it. Now, this it, none of this stuff's buffered. It's just kind of raw ADCs and IOs. And so this blackboard is a custom rolled board, which plugs directly into this which gives us our buffered IO. For instance, 
It's got all the signal conditioning and level shifting for ADCs. So um, this board has built in one, two, three, four, six voltage sensors, and we can sense from zero to thousand volts, bipolar and unipolar, depending on how you set it up. And so you just bring the wires into these little connectors and you can sense high voltage or low voltage and all signal conditions on the board. So I'll convert it to a signal between zero and 3.3 and feed it to the ADC. Then over here, we have six onboard current sensors. We have some high frequency ones that'll go up to a megahertz. And then we have some low frequency that goes up to about a hundred kilohertz. And depending on what part you populate here, you can sense current anywhere from 10 to 200 amps um, directly on board. And then all the signal conditioning is there as well. So it'll convert that to a signal between zero and 3.3 and pipe it to your ADC. And then over here, you see a bunch of digital IO. These are all level shifted and buffered. A lot of it, it so we have two different types. We have single ended and differential. It depends on what we're running and what power level we're running at, but usually at lower power levels, we run just single ended signaling and we don't have too much of an issue with common mode and so we can run single ended. And so we have, I think 24 digital outputs that are PWM, 24 digital inputs that are just inputs. And then the same is duplicated for, um, for differential. So we'll have 24 differential out PWMs and 24 differential input channel purpose. Then over here we have our isolated. This is key because this is how we communicate with it when it's running in a high voltage scenario, but an isolated RS-232 and 485. So this is 232 and this is 485. So, and it's isolated up to three or four KV. So it just essentially means that we can communicate directly connect this to co the computer and and communicate and then run you know a high voltage converter and, and not have any issues with communication or com mode or any of that stuff so so yeah we have a custom role we just call this our control board and then we buy this part plug it in here and then to zoom out we'll just wire it up this is a like a converter we built but all the sensing and digital IO comes directly off that control board and directly connects to this. So long winded answer to your question there, Eric, but this is generally how we do it. We do have some of Mohan's stuff. So this is kind of the research side of things. We want to mock something up really fast. We don't have to redo the controls at all. We just have this in house and then we just do the power electronics and then we can just wire them together. But we do have from, from a learning side of things like the educational side of things in undergraduate lab, we have a bunch of uh, Mohan's boards for teaching that course. All right. Uh, Trikanth asked something about emulators for power electronics emulators. So I think um, in terms of emulators, I, th I think what you're referring to is real-time simulation. Correct me if you're wrong, but uh, I don't actually have any. I, I, I want one, but, you know, money is always hard to come by in, in academia. And, and when you have it, you usually want to first spend it on students because they get the bulk of the work done. But um, uh, what I would say is I really want the Plex one. So it's about 10000 bucks. Um, and I've, I've written a couple grants to get a uh, Opal RT, which that one was like a hundred grand. It did, depends with the options and stuff. You can really spend a lot of money, but um, so there's that. And then there's RTDS and I'm forgetting all oh, there's D space can be configured as a real time simulator. I mean, it's not meant or built to be that way, but you can do it at a lower frequency. Uh, Opal RT, Oh, you know what? Typhoon. Typhoon's the other one. Um, but I don't own any of those systems. So there's a lot out there. And they're expensive. So like, you know, if you're trying to train students and you want to buy 10 of these, and let's just go with the Plex one at 10 grand, you're looking at 100K in, in, in hardware. And then you know, if you follow how they actually make money, there's 10 grand for the hardware, but then you have to buy a, a yearly license per station. So you're looking at another one to two K a station for the compiler. So, I mean, it, it's hard cause it adds up very quickly. And so, you know, 110 grand as your capital costs and then 10 grand recurring every year to run, you know, 10 stations of this Plex, let's just call it is, it's pretty cost prohibitive from an academic standpoint. Um, 
yeah. Anyways, that's kind of my thoughts about that. I don't own any emulators. I, I've wanted one just for the research side of things. And I, I know Typhoon really markets himself like training students, but I mean, they're expensive. It's, it's hard to, to justify the cost for that. So um, yeah, anyways, um, I'll stick around for another couple minutes if, uh, oh, okay. So Eric, um, you program Launchpad and C code? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't do the um, the thing in. See, the problem with um, with some of my colleagues, this is a very unpopular opinion, but I think I really hold true to this. If you do the GUI-based programming, a lot of times it's very hard to understand what the GUI actually does, especially with the Delfino. <laughs> The Delfino is very configurable. And when I mean very configurable, I mean it's got a lot of options to set it up. And personally, what I do is I just read the technical reference manual and read, like if I want to set up the PWM module, I just read that section. And then I set up the registers appropriately. You do that with C code and then it runs beautifully. Um, when you're doing the MATLAB GUI, um, it's just problem after problem after problem. You make one setting change here and it's a GUI, so you're not exactly sure if it's been changed in hardware. So and it's very hard to debug. How do you debug when you're in the GUI? Um, like the, the um, what do they call it? MATLAB DSP coder or MATLAB C coder. Um, so with, with the launch pad in Code Composer Studio, I mean, you just straight up in a C development environment, you can pause it on any line of C code, read the registers. Oh, I didn't set this bit in this register. This is why it doesn't work. It's very straightforward. Um, I think the, the, um, the GUI coder works well for very simple tasks, right? If you're trying to do something very simple, but a lot of stuff we're trying to do is generally not as simple as setting up, you know, just three, three phase PWM. Yeah. We could do that all day, but um, some of the more complicated things you want to do, it's just much easier to go straight to C code program flow too can be a little bit tricky when you're in a, a GUI based environment. If you've ever done, um, Oh, what is that? Um, lab view. If you've ever done lab view, um, Program flow can be a little bit hard to visualize and understand in a GUI. But again, this is all my opinion. Um, and so anyways, yeah, let me know if you have any more questions and uh, I can expand upon them or answer them.
All right, I'm going to wait about uh, two more minutes. Let any questions flush in, and then I'll then I'll end it. Well, you're absolutely welcome, Eric. Um, if you want to follow up or have any other discussions or if there's something you're looking to, that I should add to this, please let me know. Um, I think you had pointed out the book you had used in your class yesterday. And so I think I have that one on order. I wanted to take a look at that one. It's interesting uh, just to see what it's got. But thank you for all your great questions and your input, your valuable insight. Um, Please keep them coming. If there's stuff you want to see, let me know. Send an email. Um, I'm going to be developing more of these for this topic. So I kind of want to cover all the bases. So thank you. Yes, perfect, Eric. Yeah, that's the one that I'm going to pick up and just uh, take a read through and see see if there's some good stuff that I can steal from them. <laughs> but no, it's nice to always see how other people present stuff and some insight. And plus, this this has some MATLAB, which I like to include in, uh, in the uh, lecture so that people can follow along.
Okay, so I'm going to take this time to thank all of you. Thank you for following along. Thank you for your input, um, going through, pointing out my mistakes. This helps um, fix the material, make it better, makes me better, makes you guys better. So I appreciate everybody's input, all the fantastic questions. I'd like to keep this going. So please, uh, you have my email, any discussion, anything that you think of, just shoot me an email. Um, I'd love to talk. So thank you all. Um, have a good day and I appreciate everybody. Thank you.